Good morning, welcome to our daily psalm, which today is Psalm 135, Psalm 135. There are a couple of very interesting features about this psalm. Uh, the first is that <clears throat> every single verse of it relates back to, or directly quotes, or um, is quoted by some other part of the scriptures of the Old Testament. Uh, so Psalm 135 has chords tying it to, uh, to Exodus 3, Exodus 18, um, Numbers 21 and Numbers 33, Deuteronomy chapter 7 and chapter 32, and Psalms 33, 52, 92, 113, 115, 134, 136, 147. So you see, this is a very well connected psalm. It's an example of how the, the scriptures inform us as they make links with and comment on and reflect on themselves. Um, psalm 35 shows us the internal consistency, if you like, which runs through the Bible. And Psalm 135 also shows us then that the scriptures are themselves a resource for, uh, for worshipping God a resource that the worshipping community uses to shape its praise. Um, we often give thanks, don't we, for those over the centuries who have reflected deeply on the scriptures and then produced that wonderful uh, catalogue of hymns for us to draw on and keep on singing in our own worship. There's a second feature of Psalm 135, which is a, a, a literary device, really, um, concerns of the use, the use of God's name, Yahweh, it's probably translated the Lord in your Bible. Um, the name Yahweh occurs nine times in the first six verses uh, of the psalm, um, but then not at all in the next five verses, or the next six verses, verses 7 to 12. They're a reference to God, but he's referred to as he rather than by his name. Well, then there are three more occurrences of the name Yahweh in verses 13 and 14, none again in verses 15 to 18, and then six times in the last three verses, 19 to 21. And the striking thing is this, that Yahweh's name is used in sections of the psalm which are about God's relationship with his people. And Yahweh's name is very obviously omitted, not used, in verses which are about things which are outside of that relationship. It's a kind of possessiveness uh, running through the psalm then, that God is ours and we are his, and that will come out in some of the phrases in the psalm. And in that way, that sort of covenant relationship underpins and is the backdrop, the covenant of grace is the backdrop to this psalm's composition. Well, let's jump in then, Psalm 135. Uh, the first four verses constitute a summons, a call to God's people to gather to praise the Lord. It's in the gathering of the clergy and the choir, those in the house of the Lord in verse 2, the inner court of the temple, but also there the lay congregation in the outer courts. So it's a call to worship for the whole uh, people of God, um, to worship. Uh, well, I do wonder sometimes whether that word, I'm just doing a study on it, that word worship, whether it is always a a communal word, a corporate word, a plural word, plural activity in the Bible, or whether it's ever down there as a solitary activity. I rather suspect it's uh, always in the context of the gathered community. Verse 1, Alleluia. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, you servants of the Lord. You that stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God, praise the Lord for the Lord is good. Make music to his name, for it is lovely. That's a lovely verse just to pause on for a moment, that verse 3. This praise is something to give with a degree of enthusiasm and to get enthusiastic about because this God, the subject of our praise, is both good and lovely. They are simple words, but they have profound meaning, don't they? Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Make music to his name, for his name is lovely. Verse 4, for the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself. Uh, Jacob in that phrase, sentence is emphatic. Um, 
it was you, Jacob, that's the nation Israel, that's God's people. It's you that God chose, and not just chose, but chose as his personal possession. Uh, for the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself and Israel for his possession. So another word for it is treasure. He chose as, your tre- as his treasure. This is the, uh, the hymn Amazing Grace, isn't it, that saved a wretch like me, like us. Verse uh, 5 goes on. It's, um, verse 5 is, uh, refers to um, Moses' father-in-law's testimony in Exodus chapter 11 and, and made mine now personally. Verse 5, for I know, the stress here again is emphatic, I, for I know this, that the Lord is great and that our Lord is above all gods. Grammatically, the next, whatever verses it is, verses 6 to 14, um, they seem to be one continuous sentence, actually. Um, In verses 6 and 7, the psalmist spells out how God's greatness is depicted in the powerful forces that are in the oceans and up in the sky. Verse 6, the Lord does whatever he pleases in heaven and on earth, in the seas and in all the deeps. He brings up the clouds from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning with the rain and brings the winds out of his treasuries. They are all at his disposals and they are demonstrations of his power. And then verses 8 and 9 look back to the Exodus. Verses 10 to 12 to the conquest of the land. As examples of this Lord in verse 6 who does whatever he pleases in this instance for his people. The gift to his people. Verse 8, he smote the firstborn of Egypt. You must gulp on me as we read that. You know, it doesn't have to be that way, but it was. He smote the firstborn of Egypt, the firstborn of man and beast. He sent signs and wonders into your midst, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh and all his servants. He smote many nations and slew many mighty kings. I suppose this shows in a way the extent to which God treasures his nation. We just wish it wouldn't have been at the expense of others. And here's a couple of examples of the kings that were slain. Verse 11, Sion, king of the Amorites, and Og, the king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan. These two victories are recorded in Numbers 21 and 33. Verse 12, he gave their land as a heritage, a heritage for Israel, his people. And then we go back to Yahweh references again. And verse 13 and 14 is like um, it's like watching the first and last scenes of a film or reading the first and last pages of a book. There are references in verse 13 and 14 back to Exodus chapter 3 and to Deuteronomy chapter 32, which are the beginning and end of the bookends of the whole escape from Egypt and the settlement in the Promised Land episode. And the recollection underlines... Well, the nature of Yahweh and his people, their relationship, as something that is wholly undeserved, um, something that only Yahweh brought about. We're back in that amazing grace territory again. Verse 13, your name, O Lord, endures forever and shall be remembered throughout all generations. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. It doesn't sound like it to us, but those are uh, quoted out of, um, I say, from uh, Exodus 3 and Deuteronomy 32, deliberately taken here. These are the bookends and everything in between, all done by God for us. And then verses 15 to 18, again, have no mention of the, the name Yahweh. And in contrast to Yahweh, who acts powerfully for his people, the idols worshipped by the other nations are well, inert and unresponsive and lifeless and powerless. This is a, a victory chant, if you like, a victory song, which could come from the terraces of a team who have trounced the opposition 25 nil. And then it's been the team out on the pitch that's done it, not those who are singing the song. Verse 15, the idols of the nations are but silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak, eyes, but they cannot see. 
They have ears, but they cannot hear. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. Those who make them shall become like them, and so will all who put their trust in them. And then finally, the last three verses, 19 to 21, are another summons, therefore, in all the light of all this, to bless and worship the Lord. It's worth reflecting, isn't it, on the, the matter of, of blessing. Our blessing of God is, well, paltry and puny in comparison to God's blessing of us, which is huge and massive impact. But like a parent who delighted, who delights when, you know, is delighted when presented with some painted smudges on a piece of paper and told by their two-year-old that it's a picture of them. Well, God delights to receive our offerings of worship, however small they may be. Verse 19, bless the Lord, O house of Israel. O house of Aaron, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O house of Levi. You who fear the Lord, bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord from Zion, from his people, who dwells in Jerusalem. And how privileged we are to have him in our midst. We finish with that word, Alleluia, praise the Lord. Let us pray. O oh God, our God, you are great and we love you. You are good and lovely, and we are overwhelmed with gratitude to be your treasured possession. Take us deeper into your scriptures, so that our praise of you, however small, is shaped by your wondrous acts of grace towards us. May we become increasingly a people for your praise, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.